There's this kind of uh, narrative that, or discourse that we saw a little bit, and we addressed this last week, where some people are like, oh, well, you know, writers, they're not real workers, and uh, TV writers are just creating, you know, propaganda, and a kind of lack of empathy for writers. And as we pointed out last week, it's a, it's a very good way for, to help the bosses to have this divide and conquer uh, Look, framing. I, I mean- I, I would have thought relative privation would be something we had given up by yeah, now. But, right. you know, I, look, I completely understand that. It's very hard to look at somebody whose job is to to do not uh, necessarily lift stuff. You know, the, the the jobs that I used to do when I was younger, I admit I'm biased. I'm, I, I, can I swear on the podcast? Okay. Yes. Yes. I, I, I completely, when I meet writers, I tend to hire writers who have either lifted shit or taken shit. Like that mm-hmm. is that is my parameter for whether I like you. Like what was your first job? And I get that. But we are out here making entertainment for you. It's not just propaganda. It is an artistic expression. The Americans was not propaganda. You know, uh, Better Call Saul and, and is, was not, is not propaganda. You know, this is people trying to talk about society and the world around them. I mean, if you want to tell me what the propaganda message of Yellow Jackets is, please, I'd love to hear it. Uh, and I think that's kind of the thing is like, yes, there's always an element of corporate entertainment, which is going to... You know, we have had a real problem with propaganda and post George Floyd and post 2020, the writers have had a serious discussion about it. Brooklyn Nine-Nine tanked their entire show because of that, because the writers literally felt in good conscience, I can no longer write this anymore. Um, and so, you know, in each, even some of the more mainstream shows have tried to deal with it in what limited way they can without alienating their audience and their bosses. Um, and so, yes, I, I get that, but that's a really good way to other a group of writers, a group of workers who are trying to establish a precedent, not as maybe a specific precedent that what I get in my contract will help you, but a labor precedent, which is we picked a fight and we won. And every time a union picks a fight and wins, that makes somebody else go, maybe we should unionize. Yeah, like like trees. The best time to start a union was 100 years ago. The second best time is today. And every time a union wins, no matter what that union is, it helps everybody. Yeah. And we had on someone last week from the, uh, who was a UPS driver and a Teamsters member. And he's been going to the pick a line here in New York City because he says, this is how you build a working class movement. Yes. A hundred percent. We would not, we would not be nearly as effective as we are if the Teamsters and the Teamsters waved. They're like so delighted to see us. They waved to us and they turn the trucks around and spin back around. This is there's no middle class in America. It's because we forgot this, you know, because we started to think, oh, that job isn't my class and that job isn't my class. No. Do you collect a salary? Are you a capitalist or are you a worker? If you're a worker, it doesn't matter what you do. You should be in a union and you should be supporting each other. And we're rebuilding that after we screwed it up for 30 or 40 years. And now we have to rebuild it up. And that's everybody's project. Have you always been kind of politicized or did you become politicized? And my father's very amused by this because my grandfather was a union organizer. He was a truck driver. And he's very much like, oh, this is your grandfather's genes, 100%. Um, I think it was interesting because I went to school in the 90s, in, eight, late 80s and 90s in Canada. So I got an outsider's view of America during the Reagan and Bush years. And that can't help but politicize you because if you're inside the model as a middle class white guy, you're not going to get the same thing as when you're living in Canada and your friends are going, well, that's insane. And you're, you're saying, I wouldn't have known it was insane if I weren't out here. Uh, so yes, I I was not radically politicized, but then as I began to work more and more with the companies, um, you just see bad behavior and you just start fighting against it. And, um, you're, you're on one side or the other. I mean, I, that's why I, I hate this sort of, you know, why does everything have to be partisan? Because there's two sides and one is on the side of power and one is not. Pick your side. Uh, and so to whatever limited degree I've been able to do, I, I've done that. And also I'm a giant nerd, so I read a lot. And yeah, there you go. What are some books that you recommend? I'm really loving, um, I, I'm going to screw up her last name, Maria Masakata's, um, The Italian Economist. I'm reading The Value of Everything, which is her history of the theory of value theory. Uh, her, all her stuff is great. Um, I am go back, went back and read Bruno Latour. You know, we've never been modern. Uh, just the um, donut economy, and I cannot remember the name of that 
writer. I'm very sorry. Uh, but basically, uh, I also wind up getting uh, sucked into researching the thing I'm writing about. So whatever I enjoy reading about disappears as I wind up diving into uh, forensic pathology or whatever the hell I'm writing about now. So, And what are you working on now? Uh, right now, I, would, I have two things. I have my own projects, uh, one of which I just uh, came on to supervise a, an IP at uh, Amazon, or that we'll see if that deal closes because it didn't close before the, the before the strike. Um, <clears throat> but my production company that I started about eight, 10 years ago specializes in advancing traditionally underrepresented writers. So Native American writers, LGBTQ plus writers, women writers of color, uh, with the idea that I'm the old white guy they trust. And uh, look, you can trust, here's a voice you ordinarily wouldn't let in the room. Right. And, and you know, I'll help produce their stuff. And so we have a really striking show in development at HBO right now about uh, the Native American experience in the Midwest. And so we're just really excited to get these new voices on television and in film uh, because, you know, it's so striking. Hollywood's an empathy machine. Like our job, if we do it right, is to get you to see other people's viewpoints. And that's one of the challenging things about writers is we, we constantly have to put ourselves on other viewpoints. And the great struggle of the early 21st century is the death of empathy. And so really, you know, we're trying to get you to see somebody and through their voice and their story and how we show it on your screen at the same time that there's a very large section of this country uh, – which says, no, we don't want you to understand people's viewpoints. Your viewpoint is right. You know, you should be afraid. You should be huddled up. New different voices are bad. And, and this is a, one of the existential struggle, struggles of the early 21st century. Uh, it's sad that it's fallen upon our, our goofy shoulders to try to do it, but here we are. Yes. Amen. And how did you become a writer? What's your art? Uh, I was actually, um, I was doing a physics degree at McGill University in Canada. And I started doing stand-up as a hobby. I, no, I was, I went up there because I had a great degree. I, I was born in the oh, States. Okay. And I uh, had a great physics program. And I uh, wanted to write. And I started doing stand-up as a hobby to learn how to write dialogue. And I kind of fell into, remember they gave every heavy set white guy a sitcom, like for a while back in the late 90s. Or, well, I got one for a minute and a half. Uh, and then... So I fell into the TV side and then I really wanted to write more than act. And so I just kind of picked my way through various jobs. I put my head down and 30 years later, it's a career. Nice. And what are some of your favorite shows? Uh, that are on now? Uh, boy. Um, well, or from where? Better Call Saul just ended. So that's yeah. that's really crazy. So uh, Diplomat's great. Uh, Yellow Jackets is, is really fantastic. Um, High Town, I really love. Um just because I grew up on sort of the end of that Cape Cod thing. And it does a really good uh, feeling of catching that Block Island, Fire Island vibe, you know, down there. Uh, TV, Somebody Somewhere is fantastic. It's really a great look at people trying to scrape out their lives in middle America. Um, and it's just got really great non-traditional leads. So I think there's, I think the half hour space is doing really interesting stuff right now. You know, Barry's magnificent, but Barry's just the easy answer. Barry's just like, well, of course it's, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a show that kids say they got into TV writing because of it, you know, and Bill Hader being that good a director is fundamentally unfair. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't be that good an actor and that good yeah. a director. That's just and comedian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's also, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of great indie films coming out now. I mean, there's, it's just a really great experimental space. But the frustrating thing is we should be using all this great television to train the next generation of writers and the bosses aren't letting us. And as a result, you're going to see this pipeline dry up and you're going to see unique voices that you should be hearing from not get their jobs and not get their shows out there. Well, John Rogers, any final words? This has been so great. I really enjoyed uh, it. We want, to th we want to thank everyone for supporting the strike. Uh, we're very gratified that this uh, labor action seems to have gotten a lot of popular press and popular support in a way we didn't anticipate. If you would like to support us, the writers are taken care of. There is, however, the Entertainment Community Fund that you can Google. Uh, we are raising money for our friends on the cast and crew that are suffering because we're not in production. The writers themselves have raised $1.6 million for our assistance, for the people working on the sets, et cetera, who are out of work because of this. Uh, if you want to contribute even two to five bucks over there we'd appreciate it because it doesn't go to us it goes to our friends who are out of work because of this action well thank you so much john thank you very much great. for having me katie